Flushing Meadow, the United Nations General Assembly opens its fifth regular session. Retiring Assembly President Romulo accompanies Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. Leading the U.S. delegation are Secretary of State Atchison and Ambassador Warren Austin, our Security Council Chieftain. British Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevan and Britain's eloquent Sir Gladwin Jebb back up the democracies against Foreign Commissar Vyshinsky of Russia, whose prestige is shaken by UN successes in Korea. Schumann of France is among 28 foreign ministers attending. Ting Fu Xiang represents nationalist China despite Soviet objections. Delegates of 59 countries pour into the session most crucial since the UN's founding. Britain's Bevan, long in poor health, is greeted by Vashinsky inside the assembly chamber. World War II hero and fervent worker for peace, the Philippines' Carlos Romulo warns... Today, we are gathered at a desperate hour to save the peace of the world. Charging that Russia is the main obstacle, Secretary Atchison appeals for a permanent all-member United Nations Army to preserve peace all over the world. On Manhattan Island, New York City, a mighty monument to mankind's desire for that peace, the new skyscraper home of the United Nations nears completion six months ahead of schedule. Already, the 3,000 employees of the UN are being moved into the new building in shifts, with all of them expected to be permanently settled by January 1st. High above the busy streets of the world's greatest city, the organization which represents the world's greatest hopes for survival and freedom takes over in its permanent headquarters. American tradition of seaborne invasion born during World War II lives again as Navy units steam toward Korea. Their destination is Incheon, port city for Seoul, 150 miles behind the back of the main Red Korean Army. Off Incheon, our guns open fire as other U.S. guns once did off Tarawa and Iwo Jima and Okinawa. The softening up process has begun. After waging a bitter holding battle for nearly three months, the United Nations are on the offensive in Korea. Planes come overhead for a final strafing at 6.29 a.m. on September 15th. At 6.30 in the murk of morning, the first waves start for shore. In the dawn's early light, they climb up the nine and a half foot seawall. These are men of the 1st Division, United States Marines. The Marines make their beachhead secure with only 17 casualties in what has been called one of the finest examples ever of air-sea-land teamwork. Now they push inland toward Seoul. Their objective? To completely isolate the Communist Army by cutting all its supply lines. Behind them, more waves pour in to strengthen the United Nations' new second front. Some of the Marines are well-trained youngsters seeing action for the first time. Others are veterans of bloody island battles in another war. Together, they mop up the last remnants of opposition as UN forces in North and South begin to exert pressure on the nutcracker that is slowly closing on the Korean Reds. days later, as the cleanup job continues around shattered Incheon, the United Nations Supreme Commander, General Douglas MacArthur, comes ashore. Despite warnings of snipers on the way, MacArthur moves up to the front lines along roads just cleared of the enemy, past a red tank put out of action just a short time before. Examining the work of the Marines, the general exclaimed, that's a good sight for my old eyes. And the spectacle of Korean communists in defeat is a good sight for the free nations of the world. Of 
of the China Sea is Formosa, once the home of Asiatic pirates and headhunters. It is a hot, mountainous, leaf-shaped island about the size of Massachusetts and Connecticut combined. In 1895, the Japanese seized Formosa in their war with the old Chinese Empire. The island, one of the Japanese bases for the attack on Pearl Harbor and the Philippines, was seriously damaged by Allied bombings during the war. The population is mostly Chinese, five million of them, and a half a million Japanese and native tribesmen. The flat, fertile one quarter of Formosa supports the bulk of the population. At the end of the war, Formosa was restored to the Chinese. Now it is the last stronghold of Chiang Kai-shek and his nationalist government, driven from the mainland by Chinese communist armies. The Generalissimo and Madame Chiang, once the foremost personalities in Asia, stand at the head of a rejuvenated and strengthened, though all but exiled, government. From Formosa, Chiang hopes to launch the attack that will drive out the communists. Chiang has an army of three quarters of a million soldiers and women's auxiliaries, now being licked into fighting shape by American-trained General Sun Li Zhen. Sun's men make the most of equipment received earlier from the United States or left behind by the Japanese. While the nationalists prepare for the continually threatened invasion, the Chinese communists under General Mao are consolidating their position on the mainland. Although many in the West hope that Mao, objecting to harsh pressure from Moscow, may swing away from Russian influence, there is as yet no outward sign of it. Because Formosa stands against communism in Asia, America is backing the Chinese nationalists, but has also requested Chiang not to open war on the mainland. Although UN victory in Korea may avert the Battle of Formosa, coming events on this beleaguered island will be an important index to war or peace in Asia. The Egyptian Red Sea Peninsula of Sinai, where hallowed belief says that Moses received the Ten Commandments, is the ancient monastery of St. Catherine, whose Greek Orthodox monks follow an austere and penitential life, unchanged since the days of the Desert Fathers. In their library are thousands of rare handwritten documents, many of them unread for centuries. Some of them are believed to be portions of sacred scriptures long lost to the world. Now, American experts in their study of these revered manuscripts are examining and photographing one by one two million parchment pages in Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Arabic, Aramaic, and other ancient languages. Because of the monk's care, many pages are as fresh and clear as the day they were written. Among the many treasures is a scroll the monks believe is in the hand of the prophet Mohammed. It is documents like this which American scientists are rescuing from the obscurity of the centuries. It's milking time at this ultra-modern dairy in Delano, California, and these cows are heading for the barn. A lukewarm spray stimulates milk hormones before the cows move onto a conveyor line where they will be fed and milked at the same time. The conveyor, the invention of dairyman H.C. Kane, is the latest addition for subtracting milk. A milkmaid attaches standard milking equipment. The rolling line speeds the cows through at 10 feet per minute. The job is done in seven minutes, and every 35 seconds another cow steps into line. Less than an hour is needed to milk a herd of 100 cows. The milk is next processed and bottled. American inventiveness sets up a real production line on the farm. At the annual soap sculpture contest, carvers from 6 to 86 give a demonstration of their craft. White soap is the medium. It's inexpensive and easily handled and offers an excellent opportunity to translate artistic ideas into actuality. Soap Sculpture now has an estimated quarter of a million practitioners, many of whom proceed to more complicated materials. 
Top carvings in each class, junior, senior, and advanced, are picked by the judges. The winners in the competition, which attracted 5,000 entries, are The Wrestlers by Donald Stewart of Dorchester, Massachusetts, Ferdinand by Jack Pennell of Columbus, Ohio, and Insomnia by Leo Storch of Long Beach, New York. Soap sculpture proves an age-old question, it was the chicken that came first. The Swiss winter resort of Gestalt becomes a training ground for American Civil Air Patrol cadets here to receive instruction as glider pilots from the Swiss, the world's most experienced soaring experts. A Swiss instructor goes along, but it's the cadets who handle the controls. The gliders are towed to 2,000 feet before being cut loose to soar on the same west winds which in winter sweep skiing snows into the picturesque valley. The course is part of an exchange agreement under which European cadets get air training in America. It developed from a visit General Spots made after the war to apologize for the accidental bombing of two Swiss towns. So war's ill wind now blows gliders to happy landings. There's always something new in aviation. Now it's the Fairchild XC-120 pack plane, the first trailer truck of the skies. The pack plane looks like an overstuffed regular transport as it's demonstrated in Hagerstown, Maryland. But this Air Force giant embodies an entirely new concept of air transportation. Its roomy fuselage can hold troops or even a complete hospital or machine shop. After the plane has landed, the entire fuselage or pod, like the trailer of a truck, can be detached in a few minutes. The giant pod is pulled away on its own wheels to be unloaded at leisure. The pack plane can take on a new fuselage, or it can fly away without any fuselage at all, a big time saver for both military and commercial aviation. The latest model of the world's largest bomber, the B-36D, takes to the air on a test run. The 230-foot wingspread plane, whose fuselage is so long that the 15-man crew must use a scooter to get back and forth, is now powered by 10 engines. Four jet units, two under each wing, have been added to the six standard reciprocating motors. The new model has a range of 10,000 miles with a halfway bomb load of five tons. The short range load is 42 tons. It's truly a formidable addition to America's global air force. The 48 Olympics brought the world's foremost amateur athletes to London, but the brightest single star to emerge from the Games was a blonde 30-year-old housewife and mother from the Netherlands. Here in the 200-meter dash, Mrs. Fanny Blankers Kuhn shows her startling speed as she comes from behind to win. No woman had ever before won more than two gold medals at the Olympics. Fanny Blankers Kuhn won four. After the Games, the modest housewife returned to Amsterdam. Riding with her husband and two children, she received a greater ovation than her countrymen gave either Eisenhower or Churchill. Mrs. Fanny Blankers Kuhn visited Australia in 1949. At Melbourne, the slow motion camera analyzes her style in the 80 meter hurdles. Her remarkable yet relaxed muscular development is obvious as she flies over the obstacles. In the run to the tape, notice the startlingly powerful leg drive. In the high jump, Mrs. Blankers Kuhn shows fine style as she soars over the bar with apparently effortless ease. This jump is 4 feet 11 inches. Australia was quick to applaud the outstanding Mrs. Blankers Kuhn. Later in 49, the Olympic champion made a notable U.S. debut at the Los Angeles Coliseum. As anchor runner of the Glendale team in the 440 relay, she got started 15 yards behind, but watch her come. Fanny Blankers Kuhn whips past her rival as America gets a fleeting glimpse of a remarkable athlete. The latest chapter in Mrs. Blankers Kuhn's amazing career occurred recently at the European Track Championships in Brussels. Holland's flying housewife takes the 110 meter hurdles in her stride and equals the world record while doing it. In 
the 100-meter dash, Flanny Blankersplume gets off to a slow start, then suddenly everybody else in the race seems to be standing still as Fanny speeds to the finish line to remain the world's swiftest woman. Forest Hills, New York, 21-year-old Herbert Flam and 25-year-old Arthur Larson prepare to meet in competition. The prize is the Men's Singles National Amateur Tennis Championship. Herbert Flam serves. He's an agile player with much endurance, but Arthur Larson, fighting to become the first left-handed player to win the title in 20 years, takes this point. Larson serves. His strongest assets are his service, his lobs, and his passing shots. Flam relies on the volley and smash. Larson's strategy wins this point, but it's a tough, evenly matched battle all the way. Flam serves. After losing the first set, he takes the second and third. Flam serves. Moving to the net, he launches a savage attack while Larson counterattacks by lobbing the ball over Flam's head. Flam serves. Flam is kept hopping all over the court by Larson. His technique pays off, and after trailing two sets to one, Larson goes ahead. Larson serves on match point. The Larson lob lands on the baseline, and the long match is over. The crowd cheers two game competitors as Arthur Larson, who handled a Tommy gun in World War II, sharp shoots his way to the national amateur tennis crown. no compromise in the fight for Americanism. I am confident that our people will work hand in hand with any public man who in good faith does all that is possible to see that the United States so conducts herself as a nation as to conserve the honor, the institutions, and the peaceful welfare of our own citizens. Our next business will be to help guarantee the peace of justice for the world at large. There cannot be, there must not be a repetition of the crime against Belgium. I am anti-brutality. I should protest as strongly against wrongdoing by any foreign power. The little nations of the earth have a right to live. And if civilization is to endure, the great nations must respect that right. Let us unite in the one great endeavor of achieving an enduring peace with all the world. But let us not forget that the surest promise of that peace lies in our constant preparedness to meet all eventualities from without and to combat and destroy all subversive elements working from within. There can be no divided allegiance here. Any man who says that he is an American and seeks to promote foreignisms within our borders is not a true American. We have room for but one flag, the American flag. We have room for but one language, the language of the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. And we have room for but one loyalty, and that is loyalty to the American people.